previous episode, I showed you how to use Twitter Bootstrap with Rails. In this episode, we'll be adding on to the project that we built there, I'll show you how to improve the forms using Simple Form, and how to customize Twitter Bootstrap using Less, and also how to switch over to SAS if that's your preference. A lot to cover here, so let's get started. So here's the application that we built in the previous episode, and I would first like to focus on improving some of the user experience issues that this app has. One is that the flash messages are not being displayed. You can see if I try editing a product here and updating it, there's no flash message saying that the product was updated. So how do we display that using Twitter Bootstrap? Well, if you check out the components section of the documentation, you can see there's a section titled Alerts, and this will work perfectly for displaying flash messages to the user. You can see there's a red section for displaying errors and a green section for displaying the flash notices. So all we need to do is wrap the message in a div saying alert error or alert success. I'm going to add the flash messages to my application layout file right inside the container here above the columns so they show up above the content. Now, I, the way I usually do flash messages is I call flash.each to loop through them all and that passes in the name of the flash message and the actual message content into the block like this. So in here I need to uh, display a div with a class of alert then either alert success or alert error, depending on the type of flash message, and then display the message content inside of there. Now to determine the type here, I'm going to just check the name to see if it equals a notice, and then if it does, I'll return success, otherwise return error. So let's give this a try, editing this product again, and yay, there's my flash message. Now Twitter Bootstrap makes it really easy to add this little X button to close the alert. All it takes is this little bit of HTML code. So I'll just paste this into our flash message section. And now when we update our product, we get a little flash message with the X button and clicking it makes it disappear, so it works. Now that closing functionality is handled using JavaScript. And I haven't talked a lot about the JavaScript that Bootstrap provides, but includes several useful jQuery plugins. You can handle modal dialogues, uh, drop downs, tool tips that look really nice. Uh, there are popovers that display information when you hover over a section, and a whole lot more. Just check out the documentation for further details on how this works. Now, all of those jQuery plugins are already included in this Rails application. If you check out the application.js file here, you can see in the manifest there's a mention require Twitter Bootstrap, and that will load in all of those plugins. There's also a Bootstrap JS file here, which enables some of the plugin functionality in certain situations, and you may want to customize this further. All right, back to our Rails application. Another place that we can improve the user experience is inside of the forms, specifically regarding validations. But I don't have any validations on the product model yet, so let me first add some. So going inside of the product model, I'll add a couple quick validations here for name and price to ensure that those are present. And then if we try clearing one out and then submitting the form, it just takes us right back to the form without explaining our validation errors at all. Now Twitter Bootstrap includes a nice way to display error messages in a form along with coloring the form field red and so on, so it would be nice to use this in our application. But the problem is the markup for our form fields is pretty complex as it is. And if we try to embed conditional logic into here for the validations, things can get messy very quickly. So I recommend using a gem to help render out the form. A simple form recently added Bootstrap support built right in. Uh, if you use Formtastic, you can use the Formtastic Bootstrap gem for that. So I'll be using simple form in this application to clean up this form. First, you'll need to go to the gem file and I'll add the simple form gem here at the bottom. And you'll need to run the bundle command to install the gem. Next, run Rails generate simple form install and pass the double dash bootstrap option to use the Twitter bootstrap variation. So this generator gives us a handy little message explaining the various classes we can use with the Twitter bootstrap forms. And we'll just need to switch our form over to simple form four. So going back to the form template, I'll switch this over to simple form four and a form horizontal class is already provided. And we can just change these input fields to use f.input, and then we want the name and the price. And I explained uh, simple form more in episode 234, so check that out if you're interested. Now we can give this a try by editing a product, and then clearing out a name, 
And now it says the name can be blank and displays the field in red. Much nicer user experience. So now this application is looking really great, but what if we want to customize it further and make it really feel uniquely our own? For example, how do we change the color of the links and the buttons, and how do we change the way the header looks and so on? If you check out the using less section of the docs, you can find a list of variables to customize the look and feel. You can change the colors, the sizing, and so on. However, even this doesn't list all the variables available. To see that, we'll have to check out the source code. The variables are defined inside of a variables.less file, and there are a few mentioned here which aren't included in the documentation. Uh, you can see some for changing the image sprite paths and so on. You can change these variables inside of the bootstrap and overrides CSS less file. Just be sure to do it after importing the bootstrap files. For example, there are some variables already set here for changing the sprite paths to those which are compatible with the Rails asset pipeline. And there's some documentation here for changing further variables. Let's say, for example, I want to lighten up the header of this site. I could just uh, set some variables like this to lighten it up. And now watch the header as I reload the page here. It is now a light gray, and everything works as expected. Some things, however, can't be easily changed through variables. For example, let's say we want to change the color of this brand text in the header. Well, the source code for this is inside of the navbar.less file, and if you check out the brand section, which is mentioned right here, the color is set to the white variable, and while we could change the definition of the white variable, that'll probably have side effects that we don't want. Instead, we want to only change the brand here, so the variables are a little bit too limiting here. But that's not too much of an issue, since we're working with CSS here, we can easily override any styling defined by Twitter Bootstrap by just defining it again. So we can say our navbar uh, brand, let's set the color to, uh, let's say, a light yellow here, like that. And let's try this out by reloading the page. And this takes a second because it's recompiling the CSS, and now it's a light yellow. Probably not the prettiest thing ever, but uh, you get the idea. Now, over time, you may find that there are parts of Twitter Bootstrap that you don't end up using, so it would be nice to remove those to reduce the file size that is sent to the client. Well, there's any customize and download section on the website where you can choose exactly what parts you want to include in Twitter Bootstrap, and then customize and download it here. However, this will download the static files, which, if you're using less like we are here, isn't what you want, so don't do this. Instead, you should customize which files are imported in your Rails application using less. Here you can see that it's importing Twitter Bootstrap Bootstrap. And if you check out the source code for that imported Bootstrap file, you can see that it's importing many other files here, so you can use this to customize exactly what files are imported. To do so, just copy the contents of this file, and then just paste the entire thing over the content of this import bootstrap line. It'll do the same thing, but this way you can choose exactly which files to include and what to not by commenting them out here. And you can do the same thing for the JavaScript. If you check out the bootstrap JS file and the source code for the gem, you can see that it's requiring all the different jQuery plugins that bootstrap provides here. And so if you go to your application JS file, you can replace the Twitter bootstrap line here with the contents of that file so you can pick and choose exactly what you want to include. So that's how you can customize what you want to include using the Twitter bootstrap Rails gem. I want to finish up this episode though by showing you how you can use SAS instead of less if you want to. First of all, why might you consider using SAS instead of less? Well, there's a recent blog post by Ken Collins, who is the author of both the Less Rails and Less Rails Bootstrap gems, where he gives some reasons why he prefers SAS over Less. I'll leave it up to you to read this, but if you are planning to extensively modify the styling with Twitter Bootstrap, consider using SAS. Now, with the asset pipeline, it is possible to use both SAS and Less in the same application. For example, if there are some things that you override in the CSS, such as this navbar brand section, you can move this into a separate SCSS file in your Rails app. Just be certain that this bootstrap file gets loaded first. The limitations of this technique are, though, that you aren't able to interact with any of the variables and mixins that Twitter Bootstrap uses because those are defined in less. 
However, if you do want to use SAS to interact with the variables and mixins, consider using the Bootstrap SAS gem. This includes a translation of Twitter Bootstrap into SAS so that you're able to interact with uh, the variables, override them here, and so on. Let me show you here how you can switch an application over from using the Twitter Bootstrap Rails gem, which uses less, to the Bootstrap SAS gem. After you make the change in the gem file, you'll need to run the bundle command to install it. And then next, I'm going to rename this bootstrap and overrides less CSS file to endin.scss. So we're going to use sass instead of less. And then I just need to replace the contents of the file with sass code instead of less code. I'm doing basically the same thing here though. I'm setting variables like I did before. But one important distinction is that I'm setting the variables before loading bootstrap. That's a difference between sass and less. And then after I'm loading Bootstrap, then I can override any additional CSS that I might want. And then inside of my application.js file, I just need to set require Bootstrap. I can load each individual file here as well if I want to select which specific plugins to require. Check out the Bootstrap SAS README for an example on how to do that. But here, loading the full Bootstrap will work fine. Then we could try it out by reloading our application and it looks the same. And it behaves the same. Everything's like normal. We're just using SAS instead of less with the Bootstrap SAS gem. Well, that's it for this episode on Twitter Bootstrap. Give it a try, and even if you don't end up using everything, you can always select and include only the bits and pieces that you like. And you can also use it for prototyping, too. It's a great way to get an application up and running quickly and make it look great. Well, thanks for watching. Hope you found this useful.